Hey there, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another Star Trek review, and this time it is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Came out in 1982, which was a big year for sci fi movies. You had E.T., Blade Runner, John Carpenter's The Thing, fantasy like Conan the Barbarian, and plenty more. The first film, which was more of a slower pace, more like 2001, got mixed reviews, so I guess they figured for the second film, bring a little bit more action to it. And for many people, this is their favorite. And I enjoy this film. I think it's a solid film. It's not my top three. It's in my top five favorite Star Trek films. Like I mentioned before, my favorite is For the Voyage Home. Then the first one, the motion picture, then the search for spot part three, and then I'd say part six, undiscovered country, and then this one. And people may go, why is it rated so low? I don't consider it low. I, I like all of the first six movies, including part five. But as you know, everyone always talks about the film for good reasons, a great flip, but everyone always talks about it, so. I don't know, maybe I'm just sort of the type that likes to root for the underdog, I don't know. Very well directed by Nicholas Meyer, who would come back for Star Trek VI. And this is, in a way, a sequel. Not in a way, it is a sequel to the original series had an episode called Space Seed, which had Ricardo Montalban as Khan, and this is the return of Khan. The cast worked very well together. William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly. Wonderful villain with Khan. His broad chest and his way of turning the sentence and way of speaking. He has a lot of presence as the villain Khan. Definitely, I think most would consider him the best villain in a Star Trek movie for good reason. You also have people like Kirstie Alley as Savage. I always forget the character's name. It was, uh, I believe it was Savage. I don't know why I always forget her character's name. And then in two, I mean in three and four, be played by Robin Curtis. But Kirstie Alley did fine with the role she had. Also, you had Merritt. Utrecht as David, who we find out is Kurt's son. Sally, he passed away from AIDS at the end of the 80s. I remember him also as William Radsdale's friend at Fright Night Part 2. And he would come back in the third movie of Star Trek. He did a good job. Uh, Paul Winfield from the Terminator, among others. He's in the flick as a captain of a ship, which Chekhov is with. In the opening, you have the great scene with the Kobayashi Maru, and it's the test that you can't win, the no-win situation. I can imagine people the first time seeing this, seeing the opening film, they just start seeing people die. Wait, wait, wait Sulu's dead, and now McCoy's dead, Spock's dead, what's going on? And then it's been a test for people to deal with a no-win situation. It has a, nice a lot of nice character moments, like Kirk, who's an admiral, dealing with age, dealing with getting old. He feels old, he feels worn out. Like, what is my place anymore? It's Kurt's birthday, he's given these glasses, and even McCoy's like, come on, it's your birthday, why are we acting like it's a funeral? And they have a nice conversation, they work well together. And then Merritt Butrick, as well as the woman who used to be Kurt's old flame girlfriend, they're working on this thing called Project Genesis, which is life from lifelessness. If you put on a dead moon, it'll create life. Well, on the other side, if you put it on a planet that already has life, it will destroy that and recreate life over that. So it could be used more powerful than atomic weapon. 
And in a way, sort of the atomic weapon or any kind of weapon race between the Klingons and the Federation. And the third movie that happens, which I thought was an interesting idea. I know I'm skipping it with the third movie. But the, you, even though this wasn't planned as a trilogy, two, three, and four, there's a lot of cool ends and little tidbits that the fact that it wasn't planned is pretty surprising and very fortunate. The fact that you have this Project Genesis planet, well thank God it creates life and everything goes a lot fast with life because then at the end when, Co when uh, Spock's coffin lands there, the fact that the character says you know, it accelerates organisms, lifespan and such, it's a nice sort of sci-fi backdoor to get Spock life again. And then you get to the fourth movie. Well, thank God they got the bird of prey because now they're going to stay cloaked instead of having the ship and dealing with how the hell they're going to get to the ship. And, you know, no one can notice it or well, make it invisible. Like little things that you think about, it's like, well, this is a trilogy, two, three, and four that worked out very well. Paul Winfield and Chekhov, they looked at this planet and Chekhov realizes, oh my god, Botany Bay, that's Khan. Now, of course, it's always weird when you watch this because in the original series, Chekhov was not part of the cast. I believe Space Seed was part of season one or so, one or two, and Chekhov had not come onto the series until like season two or three. So Chekhov was not on the cast, but yet Khan goes, I never forget a face. I know you. And it's like, how the hell do you know him? You guys never met. You never looked at each other face to face. And what's, if you go on YouTube, uh, Walter Kane has gotten that question many times. He comes up with a fun story, like about how, see, there's a, on the show, there was a deleted scene where... Uh, Khan really needed to use the bathroom very badly. It was knocked on the door and let me in. And I finally open it and Khan tells me, I will never forget your face. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, he's joking, of course. Said you have to spell that out. But you, you find on YouTube, uh, Walter Kennedy has some fun with that. Even he, he would admit later on he knew that was ridiculous. But he did not want to say anything because he was getting some stuff to do with Chekhov. He was getting some, something to do as a character. He's getting more lines of dialogue. And he figured, well, if he said something, maybe they would get someone else in that position. He wouldn't get the lines and the dialogue. So he kept his mouth shut, even though he knew that was that didn't make any sense continuity-wise. But you just have to go with it. But again, when, if you watch the series, like, well, that makes no sense. I know you. How? <laughs> but Ricardo Montalban, he's great as Khan. Does a wonderful job just enjoying and relishing the role as the bad guy. And how he was sent down by Kirk. And apparently things were fine. But then one planet got fucked up and it shifted orbit and things were laid to waste. And his wife died in the process. And so... You get more of a sense as to why Khan wants to kill Kirk. More so than in Star Trek Nemesis, which is just a shitty remake of this. And if you're a fan of Star Trek Nemesis, that's fine. I hate that movie. I, I watched that film. It was fucking pain to sit through. It ripped this off so much. To the point of, oh, let's have a character who shows either little to no emotion, and then does a self-sacrifice at the end, but leaves a little bit of himself behind in case that can live on. And then you have the villain who has a personal grudge against the hero, but also has this doomsday thing that he wants or wants to use that will kill everybody or kill this and that. And you're like, come on. And even Nemesis, it, it, stupid when they did that, because, yeah, these guys beat the Xiaomi, the Romulans. They, they beat the fuck out of me for ten years, man. And so now that I'm with their, the guys who don't like the Romulans, the Remus, 
who helped me? What about your revenge? What about kill the Federation? Wait a minute, what about the Romans? They beat the shit out of you for 10 years. No, nah, I'm no work for them for now. I'm going to get the Federation just because... Why? I don't know, because the strip told me to. Like, this made sense where Khan, who is, you know, from the episode and this movie, you did a good sense that he has an ego, he's egotistical, he's thinks he's superior, superior intellect. They even mentioned dialogue with Spock and uh, Kirk about that. Hell, even Nemesis and this movie both have a fucking starship fight in a fucking nebula. That's how much of a ripoff Star Trek Nemesis is. It was fucking insane. And this was just done so much well, better, especially the ending where Data dies, you're like, oh, okay. When Spot dies, even though he's alive in the next movie, I just pop that in, it's still very effective. And Nicholas Meyer once said, doesn't matter if a character dies, it matters if he dies well. It was a very effective death scene that really goes for the emotions. Uh, interesting idea with these little uh, creatures that can go into your head and make you susceptible to suggestion and the scene where it gets put into Chekhov and Paul Winfield's ears. So, ooh, shit. Kurt, McCoy, Spock, and others are with all these new recruits. One of them, I think, is Scotty's nephew, I believe. And It's funny, there's one more where I think Spock is looking at Kirstie Alley and calls her Mr. Savage. I'm like, Mr. Savage? I, I know this sounds stupid, but is that how it is in the military or whatever? You call anyone Mr. no matter what? Isn't it? Would it be like Miss Savage? Or is this female Vulcan not a female? <laughs> Does she hold more secrets than uh, the movie told us? It was just weird that Spock called her Mr. Savage, not Miss Savage. But I don't know, maybe it miss means something derogatory. I don't know. It just struck me funny if you listen closely. Um, sometime after they put the creatures in Chekhov and Paul Winfield's ears, you listen like Spock, he called Mr. Savage. And I'm like, Mr. <laughs> It's a sleepaway camp, but uh, you really get a good sense of the friendship between Kirk and Spot, the friendship where Spot is very adamant, hey, something goes wrong, you're going to be the commander. I have no ego to bruise. Uh, if I may speak freely, sir, I think taking the job of Admiral was a mistake. Because commanding a starship is your first and best destiny. Anything else is a waste of material. You're my superior officer. And you're my friend. I have been always shall be your friend. And you get that at the end of the film. And you get a good sense of, of the two. And, and their friendship. Which is one of the good strengths of the movie. As well as all the movies. <clears throat> Kurt shows McCoy and Spock the Genesis Project, which is an interesting idea. Life from lifelessness, how to you know, turn a dead moon into full of life. And also you definitely get more of that submarine type of aircraft, I mean, aircraft, um, battle. That submarine type of battle, which they try to do in that movie Wing Commander, but it, it just didn't work well in that Wing Commander movie. It worked a lot better in a movie like this. You know, they, they get fired on because Khan has gotten this other spaceship, the starship, and then Kurt and Spock are able to get these codes that... Which, that was the thing, they, the thing with the codes, they did that and I think Star Trek... I want to say Generations? Yeah, I want to say Generations. Because they kidnap Jordy and they put the visor on him and he looks, oh, that's how we get the shields down. And then Data goes, oh, I'll just uh, do that, blah, blah, blah. Oh, shields down, shoot him. And it was like, it was done here because there was actually a buildup of suspense. I'm like, oh, shit, that's what they're doing. And 
trying to be smart about it and fake out con. Like when Kirk is telling Spot, you keep nodding your head as if I'm giving you orders. So like there's a little bit of tactics to it. And at least there's a little bit of suspense to that moment, unlike in Generations, which I, is a piece of shit. When I get to that, it's going to be an epic run, because Star Trek Generations to me is the worst fucking Star Trek movie. Sorry. If you like the film, that's cool. We disagree. And this back and forth battle with the phasers, it's definitely more of an action film. I think it was definitely what people wanted at that point. They wanted something to happen. Uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, people were bored by it. I disagree. It's one of my favorite films. I love Star Trek The Motion Picture. And like I said, I've, I'll say kind of this is my second favorite film after part four. I think it's a beautiful movie, but this definitely ups the action, the, the tactics. It was a lot of fun to watch. You know, and it's fun. It was fine for it to be different. It didn't need to be a copy of the first one. That's cool about these movies. The first one was more like 2001 and I liked it for that. This one is much more of an action and the revenge of the bad guy. Three was definitely more of a character piece of the characters getting their moments to shine and dealing with the clean ons. Um, fourth one was a lot of fun and lighthearted but it wasn't annoying humor. The fifth one I enjoy, especially the, the three Kurt, Spock, and McCoy trinity of characters, sort of like a buddy movie with the three of them. And then part six had the sort of that little bit of racism angle with Kurt and a little bit of politics, but not to the point of countless scenes of senators and, and bullshit. So each movie felt like their own film. They weren't just ripping off a previous movie, which I appreciate. And I really enjoy. Maybe that's what, well, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why I enjoy all six of these uh, the f movies, the first six movies, plus the cast. Uh, I love Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, James Doohan, Michelle Nichols, George Takei, Walter Koenig. Like James Doohan, may he rest in peace. DeForest Kelly, Leonard Nimoy, may they rest in peace. It's like seeing old friends that uh, I miss. Uh, when Kirk, and there's some gruesome stuff in here too. Like I said, when the creatures go into the ears, that's a bit gruesome. When Kirk McCoy and Kirstie Alley, they go down, they find all these dead bodies hanging upside down. Not skins, <laughs> although that'd be interesting. Enterprise face off against the Predator. <laughs> Like predator ship, that'd be interesting. It'd be different, <laughs> but hey, I wouldn't mind seeing that. The Enterprise versus a predator ship, interesting. But still, the finding these care, uh, finding people dead upside down and blood on them for Star Trek, pretty graphic. Which is one of the reasons why this was given a PG rating. And this is well before PG-13. I, I always forget, I think Red Dawn was the first PG-13 movie. I could be wrong on that, but I, I know that's one of the first, if not the first PG-13 film, the original Red Dawn. But I know there's films like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Gremlins that led up to the PG-13 rating. But he, back here, do we were quite a bit for PG. They find Chekhov, and they get beamed underground. And Paul Winfield and Chekhov, they're fighting these little creatures inside their heads. Paul Winfield shoots himself. So there you go. Think about suicide. You have suicide in the movie. Uh, you have people on the Enterprise dying, like Scotty's nephew. Uh, this one creature that gets out Chekhov's head, and Kurt shoots it. Love the lit phaser sound effects and the look of the, the phasers in this. Well, usually in the show I'd be like this, but here's more like a gun. And of course you have the great scene. This is gone, you bloodsucker! I am sure you keep missing the target. 
If you want me, you're going to have to come down here. I will not come down there, Kirk. I've already done it. I've hurt you. And I wish you'd go on hurting you. I'm going to leave you as you left me. Buried alive. Buried alive. Of course, Kirk going, God! God! Which I'm not going to yell because I don't want to blow up my fucking voice. And you know, that gets parodied a lot, but when you watch the scene, it works. See, when you watch it and start to into fartness, it's laughable with Zachary Quinto as Spock going, God! <laughs> That's laughable. That's fucking funny. It's not meant to be. And start to into fartness. Me calling that shows you how much I fucking like that movie. I like Peter Weller and Benedict Cumberbatch. He doesn't do a bad job, even though it's weird that this is the alternate universe, but it's supposed to be kind of the same, but just a little bit changes. But yet, we're calling Montebon turns into Benedict Cumberbatch. It's kind of weird. And then apparently, oh, there's a comic book that explains it. <laughs> it explains how they changed uh, almost anything, everything remotely look wise and more wise. <laughs> Okay. I'll give more to that later. But see, you look at that, and that's how it's done funny in a laughable, silly way. Here, it works. And it's helped by the music. The, the music this time, you don't have Jerry Goldsmith. He would not come back till part five. You did James Horner. James Horner would do Star Trek 2 and 3. And then another person who didn't do a Star Trek before or since did part four. And I'll get to that when I talk about part four. And then Jerry Goldsmith did part five. And then some of the Next Generation movies. But James Horner does a good job. Brings his own theme. I like the theme that do 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 Now, I, I swear I've heard this before, and one day I want to review Crawl, because I like Crawl. I remember one time hearing, because James Horner worked on that, and he did a great job with that store, that the, some of the store in Crawl was going to be in this movie. Like the, the riding the fire mares, which is my, one of my favorite themes. That do, new, 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 new. And I know my friend Mike OCP, he did a video tribute to Star Trek a long, long time ago. It's still on his channel with that music. And you know, I like the theme in this movie, but man, I just picture if that. You just type out Crawl, K R U L, riding the fire mares. And listen to that music. That I can see that working for Star Trek movie. I really can. But yeah, this they do a really good job. He does a really good job with the score. I would say I still prefer Jerry Goldsmith's scores to part one and part five. Yes, part five. I would say of all the movies, those are my two favorite scores of Star Trek films. Is one and five. But James Horner for two and three, he does a good job. I like James Horner and I miss him. I mean, one of my favorite scores of all time is Aliens, and yeah, he did tend to rip himself off, but there's quite a few composers that do that as well, and I've liked a lot of stuff that he's done, and I miss it. He's done a lot of good stuff. Even when stuff he's ripped off of himself, I still like the score, like Project X. I hear elements of Aliens and other stuff, but I still like the score to Project X. And I'm talking about the one with Matthew Broderick. I know there's some comedy found footage movie later on called Project X. I'm talking about the Matthew Broderick one with Helen Hunt. I enjoy that movie. But yeah, you get a nice look at the character of Kirk who feels old and worn out. And you get this nice shot of the Genesis cave. Well, once in a while in that cave you see that it's just a painting. But... I miss stuff like that. I mean, nowadays, I know it's all CGI, but I miss the old school matte paintings or just simple paintings or that kind of old school effects. I miss that. 
because there's certain tangibleness even if you know in your head it's a painting I don't know I'm just being nostalgic I guess and uh, you also I also enjoyed the other aspect of the Kirk character here where he's like he doesn't I don't believe in the no one scenario and you realize he fooled Khan and uh, he had you know backup plans, able to connect with Spock, able to beam up, and he tells Kirstie Alley, "I don't like to lose. I don't believe in the no-win scenario." So I like that. You have a cool fight in the nebula, playing off of Khan's ego, firing lasers, phasers at each other like submarine warfare. I liked that when the when it rises above behind Khan's ship and uses photon torpedoes. And this is where James Horner's music really works for the film. Really the best. I love that. And recall Montalban is a very strong villain. I love his dialogue, his uh, mentions of stuff like Moby Dick. The last I grapple with thee, for hate's sake I spent my last breath at thee. And then you get to the finale where they have to escape because Khan has started the Genesis thing. Spot does the remember the McCoy, goes in there with radiation, fixes the ship's engines, gets out of there. And you have that great scene where they both, Kirk and Spot, see each other. It's like, don't grieve, Admiral. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And Kirk's like, or the one. I have been and always will be your friend. Live long and prosper. And they both touch and Spot dies. And then you have the funeral and Kirk going, of all the souls I've encountered, his was the most human. And I gotta say, watching it again, it, it was, it was kind of tough. Because I have not seen this movie since Leonard Nimoy passed away. And watching it again was really tough. Never knew the guy. Never knew any of these people. But, you know, you're seeing... I mean, it's the character Spock, but you've seen him die. And I think that's one of the things I hate about the J.J. Abrams films is that I would rather Spot be the last time we saw him with Star Trek VI. I know he was in some episodes in this generation, but still, to see that he went off into the sunset, that character, after dying, coming back in part three, but then the, the bring him back in Star Trek 2009, where he goes back in time because this thing that fucked up, and he was kind of at fault, kind of, and then he was left on this planet to see Vulcan die and blow up the planet. The planet gets blown up, and then he's not there with friends or family or anyone. He's stuck there in this alternate reality, or however the fuck you want to call it. To then, when he did pass away, there's a fucking plaque of him in Star Trek Beyond. So he didn't make it back to where he came from. He didn't make it back to anywhere. He just... Which, are, I mean, considering Star Trek Four, you would think you'd be able to do time travel. I mean... Star Trek 4, they went you know, around the sun for time travel. And then, like, he died with no friends, no family, and, and this alternate reality, watching his planet be destroyed. And then, and Star Trek and the Darkness to come in for 30 seconds to give exposition. As if Zachary Quinto Spock is on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Let me call a lifeline, let me call a friend. Uh, Spock, will you, old Spock, will you know about Khan? Well, okay, since you can't figure it out on yourself, then you're cheating. And that's the fate of Spock. The Leonard Nimoy. His character. Another reason why I hate those fucking J.D. Abrams movies, man. My Star Trek Beyond, I didn't hate. But I'll, I'll get to those later, but... You, know, you watch this, and it really uh, is sad. But it's done very effective. The actors do a great job. The score. They remember Spock. Uh, because of the explosion of this Genesis thing, a new planet has been born. 
the end of the film, you see the coffin there. So, and you hear Leonard Nimoy's voice saying, the bullet going, no man has gone before. So there's a sense of hope. And even Kurt's looking, it's like, how do you feel? He's like, young. I feel young. And let's see that sense of hope. And, yeah, this is a great sequel. It is. Great villain con. The score fits the film well. Moves at a good pace. Nice supporting cast of Paul Winfield and Kirstie Alley. And, of course, Ricardo, Ricardo Montalban. Merit Boutre did a good job. The effects by Al M. Industrial Light Magic. Uh, they, they're... The effects worked very well for the flick, especially during the starship battles. A lot of memorable sequences like the con yell and the little creatures going inside people's ears, and of course the death of Spock, which was very effective and emotional. And Nicholas Meyer, gotta say, he impressive directing for a guy who Probably at this time, definitely was probably the biggest film he had directed. And for most people, they would say it's a sequel that's better than the original. To me, I still prefer the first one for the reasons I said in that review, but uh, I know I'm alone in that. But this is still a damn good flick. And I know there's a... Well, this is the director's edition. I don't know all the differences... I don't know what was added in or what the I don't know what the difference is between the extended director's edition and the theatrical cut. I know the director's cut of this has been released on Blu-ray, so it shows what Paramount favors. Not the, not the motion picture. And but you know, I understand it's definitely the most popular of the Star Trek movies, and that's why. And like I said, it's a damn good flick. So, thanks for watching, take care, and next time I'll talk about my third favorite Star Trek film, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. See you guys later.